Today we're going to do lab one, which is on the muscles of the axial skeleton, which will include muscles of the skull, the neck, and the thorax. So what we're going to do is start with the skull uh, and the head. And when you look at models in lab, the first thing you have to recognize is that the models are done so that you can see different layers of muscles. And so, for example, on the model we're looking at, uh, the right side of the model here is superficial, and the left side of the model is deep. So as you're looking for muscles, that three-dimensional relationship becomes important to begin to understand uh, how muscles are located on the head and skull itself. So we're going to start with the superficial muscles of the skull. And so we have a muscle that exists on our forehead, which is called the frontalis muscle. It actually uh, is associated with a very broad sheet of connective tissue that goes over the superior aspect of the head, which is the gala aponeurosis. And then that connects with a muscle that we see posterior on the skull itself on, in the occipital region, so it's called the occipitalis. So in recent years, people have taken the frontalis component and the occipitalis component and grouped them together into a muscle we call the epicranius with a frontalis and occipitalis portion. So as we go down on the face, well, we're going to start with the superior and work inferior for superficial muscles. Uh, the muscle that surrounds the eye here uh, is called the obicularis oculi, and it's responsible for closing your eye. As we move downward, we'll see muscles associated with the mouth, and the muscle that's going around the mouth here is the, uh, is the obicularis Orus, and it closes or the mouth as in perching the lips. So as we move to the side component on the skull, we'll see muscles that are associated with the muscles of the mouth, uh, the obicularis oculi. So we have a muscle here that runs from the edge of the obicularis oculi to the zygomatic bone. So it's, it's referred to as the zygomatic major. We have a little muscle that's actually been cut right here so that we can see a muscle deeper uh, in the cheek component. And this is the rhizorus. Deep to the rhizorus is a muscle we're seeing here that is used to compress your cheeks. So that is the buccinator. Posterior to the buccinator, superficially, we have a very large muscle that is associated with the mandible, and its primary role is in chewing, so it's referred to as the masseter. As we move toward the inferior aspect of the chin, we have a little muscle midline on either side, which is called the mentalis, and then just lateral to the mentalis, running at an angle, is a muscle called the levator labi inferioris, and it uh, folds the lower lip downward as in uh, pouting. If we go to the anterior aspect of the upper lip, we have a muscle that we can see with two components here and here that are coming off the upper lip, and these are the levator palpebrae, excuse me, the levator uh, lay by superioris. We actually have a muscle that we can see in the inferior component of the chin area here, which is a muscle that opens your mouth. It's called the digastric because it has two uh, bellies, so gastric is a reference to belly. So the belly we're seeing here running from the mandible to the hyoid bone is the anterior belly of the digastric. As we go to the deep side over here, there is a muscle that runs from the hyoid bone to the mastoid process right here, and that is the posterior belly of the digastric. 
and both of those muscles work together to open your mouth. So as we look at the deep components and muscles to the face, when the overlying muscles and aponeurosis have been removed from the skull area, we have a muscle that's called the temporalis because of its origin on the temporal bone here. And it'll be a muscle that assists the masseter with mastication or chewing. As we move to a deeper component, we have two muscles that come off processes just lateral to your nasal passage. So the muscle we're seeing here in the window which is actually has fibers running anterior to superior, anterior to inferior, is the lateral pterygoid. Down here, just below the, the ramus of the mandible that's been cut, we have a muscle whose fibers are running superior to inferior. That is the medial pterygoid. And you can see that the medial pterygoid is uh, leading into the muscle that we looked at on the other side, which forms the cheek itself, which is the buccinator. Now, on this side of the skull, we can also find muscles that are associated with the tongue and muscles that help stabilize the hyoid bone itself. So as we look in this window behind the uh, ramus of the mandible and in front of or anterior to the mastoid process here. We have a muscle that is originating on the styloid process that you learn in the skull that would be right here. And it goes down to the tongue itself. So this muscle is the, stylo gas, the styloglossus muscle. And then the muscle just posterior to that, which is coming off the styloid process, and going down to the hyoid bone is the stylohyoid. And then the next muscle uh, posterior to that is the one we already covered, which would be the digastric. Now, as we look at the neck, then in the neck region, we have a muscle that's real superficial that is actually uh, coming uh, inserting on the mastoid process here. When we look at a full figure here in a little bit, we'll see that this muscle actually attaches to the clavicle and the sternum below it. So it's called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. If we kind of remove the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is what we've done here, that's what allowed us to see these deep muscles, the styloglossus here, stylohyoid, and the posterior belly of the digastric. As we look at the posterior component on the neck itself, then we see a little triangle piece of muscle that's a very large muscle coming from your back. It's attaching to the occiput here. So this muscle is the upper trapezius. We will find more of that as we move down uh, into appendicular muscles. The muscle that's deep to it, we see running at an angle here is the splenius capitis. And that's the muscle that we see here in this window as well, is the splenius capitis. So the muscle gets its name capitis because it inserts on the skull. And we're gonna see some other muscles that are named in a similar fashion. So there is a muscle we're seeing in this triangular window right here. And it's a muscle that runs along the vertebral spines uh, and so the muscle is called the spinalis muscle. And since this part of the spinalis muscle actually attaches to the skull, then it's referred to as the spinalis capitis muscle. Looking at the most uh, superficial muscle seen in the neck on this half head is a muscle we see overlying sternocleidomastoid that we just looked at. So notice that sternocleidomastoid fibers are running this way. And overlying it, we have muscle fibers running this way. This is a very, very thin muscle just under the skin in the neck. And it runs from the clavicle and um, sternum up to the angle of the mandible here. And so it's called the platysma. 
Now, if we remove the platysma and we remove sternocleidomastoid and cut deep into the tongue region, then what we can see is are some muscles that are associated with stabilizing the hyoid bone and also moving the tongue. So kind of as a quick review, as we were looking at the deep component in the last skull, we saw this most posterior muscle, which was the posterior belly of the digastric. The muscle just anterior to it is the uh, stylohyoid, coming from the styloid process here and going to the hyoid bone. And the muscle most anterior to that is this muscle, uh, originating on the styloid process and inserting on the tongue, so hence the name styloglossus. So inferior to the tongue, we have a couple of muscles. We have this muscle right here that is originating on the hyoid bone and inserting on fascia of the tongue. And so it gets the name hyo for hyoid bone, glossus for tongue, hyoglossus. It is, by the way, the muscle that doctors try to get you to use when they're wanting to look at your throat and they say, say, ah, that depresses the tongue which is the action of this muscle. So the muscle that is sort of midline on this model is a muscle that comes off of the inside of the mandible, and there's a little enlargement on the inside of the mandible. So it's called the genium. So this is the genioglossus muscle going from the genium to the tongue itself. So if we kind of look at these muscles associated with the tongue, the genioglossus is a tongue protractor, it pushes the tongue out as in sticking your tongue out. This muscle is a tongue depressor and this, the styloglossus that we talked about earlier is actually a tongue retractor bringing it back in your mouth and elevator. So these muscle, three muscles, all allow us to manipulate our tongue and we use that for mastication or chewing and for creating words uh, by, by changing the relative position of our tongue. So what we're going to do next is go deep to muscles that we would see within the eye itself. So there's a muscle on your list that unfortunately we, we can't see on muscles, but the obicularis oculi is the muscle that, op that closes your eye we would have a muscle whose fibers would run uh, from inferior to superior in the upper eyelid and it would actually elevate your eye. So if we could see a muscle here, it would be called the levator, lay by, excuse me, levator palpilbrae superioris. Uh, so again, the levator palpilbrae superioris. Now if we were able to look at an eye that had been dissected, there'd be a muscle that would actually uh, just be superior to this muscle in the orbit of the eye. And that would be the levator, le levator palpilbrae superioris that we just talked about. So when we look at muscles of the eye, we have four muscles that we call rectus muscles because their fibers run parallel to the visual axis of the eye. And so we have a superior rectus that we see uh, in the model right here. If we put this muscle back together so that it's in place, then the muscle that we would see right here would be the lateral rectus muscle. If we move the lateral rectus muscle out of the way so we can see a deep muscle in the floor of the eye, then we would, this muscle would be the inferior rectus muscle. And then if we move both the superior oblique, the superior and rectus and the lateral rectus out of the way, then we would see a muscle that is in the uh, medial aspect of the eye, which is the medial rectus muscle. Now, because rectus muscles fibers all run anterior to posterior, then they move the eye and the pupil in the same direction as the fibers name, so superior, lateral, medial, and inferior. We have two muscles that are obliques. So as you'll recall, the word oblique means at an angle. And so in the inferior aspect of the eye, we have a muscle that we can see at an angle right here. 
which is the inferior oblique muscle. And then in the superior aspect of the eye, we have a muscle that we see a tendon right here. And if we follow the tendon around and raise this muscle, we see a muscle in the superior aspect of the medial aspect of the orbit here, which is the superior oblique muscles. Now, because both of these muscles' tendons uh, attach to the posterior aspect of the eye, they actually pull the posterior aspect of the eye in an opposite direction that the pupil is actually going to rotate. So if you pull the back of the eye superiorly and medially, so the back of the eye moves in this direction, the pupil will actually rotate down and lateral. The same is true of the inferior oblique muscle. It uh, inserts on the back of the eye, and it's going to pull the back of the eye posterior and medial, so the pupil of the eye is actually going to move superior and lateral. So those, those actions sometimes can be confusing uh, when we first initially look at those muscles. So that kind of concludes our discussion of muscles that are directly associated with the skull itself. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move to a model where we can actually see muscles in the neck a little better and muscles associated with uh, uh, the axial skeleton in terms of the thorax and the abdomen. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to review a couple of muscles that cross the cervical region of the neck that we talked about on the skull itself, but we're going to now look at how they uh, are, are involved with the thorax as well. So this muscle that we see that is associated with the mastoid process as its insertion, if we follow it downward here, we can actually see that its origin is on the manubrium of the, the sternum and the clavicle. So the muscle gets its name based upon its origins, sternocleido, and then its insertion, mastoid. So we can see the sternocleidomastoid as we look at that. And then again, if we look at the posterior compartment as we rotate the model around, then the trap was the muscle that we saw superficially. And we see that the trap is a very large complex muscle associated with the scapula. If we remove the trap on this side, then there's an underlying muscle that's running at an angle here, which is the splenius capitis that we talked about on the earlier uh, neck of the head model. So now what we want to do is we want to think about uh, muscles that are associated with the thorax. So we actually have muscles that are, occur between the ribs. And they're layered, so one muscle is superficial, so it's more external. And then the inner muscle is deep, so it's more internal. And they get their name because the muscles exist between the ribs. So costal is a word that usually is a reference to the ribs. And so intercostal tells us the muscle is between the ribs. So this outer one here is the external intercostal. And then the inner muscle is the internal intercostal. And these muscles are going to be involved in aiding uh, with respiration as we talk about that in the future. So the other muscle that is associated with the thorax that is involved in respiration is an internal muscle. So as we remove the chest plate and we rotate it around, what we'll be able to see is that we have a muscle that stair steps up on the ribs to the xiphoid process. And then we'll see a mirror image of that on the other side of the thorax. So the origin of this muscle is on the ribs and the xiphoid process. And this is your diaphragm. Now, if we look internally, then what the diaphragm does is it originates 360 degrees around you, uh, off the lower ribs posteriorly, the lumbar vertebrae, and then the ribs and the xiphoid process anteriorly. So this is the diaphragm in place. So the fibers of the diaphragm 
are running uh, from inferior at origin to superior. And they all insert on this broad sheet of connective tissue that's at the center of the diaphragm. And this is called the central tendon. So what actually happens is as the diaphragm contracts, then it pulls the central tendon downward. And that's what actually allows us to breathe in. And then when the diaphragm relaxes, it uh, domes back up and allows us to breathe out. Uh, so make sure that you recognize the diaphragm as the muscle we're seeing here, but also the origins of the diaphragm that we see inside of the chest wall here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the chest wall back in place for uh, a little bit. And we're going to talk about the muscles that are associated with the abdomen uh, superficially. So midline, on either side of midline, we have a muscle that is associated with the abdomen that comes off lower ribs, the xiphoid process, and the pubic crest. And it is divided into component parts. So it's called the rectus abdominis is the fibers are running parallel to the midline and they cross the abdominal region. And so here we're seeing the rectus abdominis fibers. Over here we're seeing fascia covering the rectus abdominis. And it's what uh, well muscular people looks like. They have six uh, muscle fiber parts that we see. And so some people refer to that as the six pack. So as we move to the lateral aspect of the abdomen, the most superficial muscle is a muscle that runs at an angle, uh, and so it's called the external oblique. On this side of this model, we're more we're deeper. So as we move to this side of the model, we see a a muscle that's actually running at an opposite angle, and that's called the internal oblique. And so when we're looking at the side wall of the abdomen, we have an external oblique underlined by an internal oblique. And then internally, we have the deepest of our abdominal muscles uh, from the lateral part. Uh, and that is the muscle that we're seeing right here, which is the transverse abdominus. So these fibers that we're seeing running on a transverse plane belong to the transverse abdominus muscle. So what we're going to do now is start with muscles associated with the back. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with the most anterior of those muscles. And so on a model, because we can't tease it apart layer by layer, we're actually going to have to look at the inside of the abdomen to find this muscle. So as you look inside the abdomen, you will find a muscle right here that is actually coming off the 12th rib and crossing the lumbar region to the iliac crest. And so this muscle is called the quadratus because it's rectangular in shape and lumborum because it crosses the lumbar region. So the quadratus lumborum is our anterior most uh, of the muscles of the back. So now as we rotate the model around, we're going to look on the superficial side uh, over here and we'll see that we have the trapezius that's covering most of the back and the latissimus dorsi covering here, which are muscles we're going to do when we do the appendicular skeleton. So what we have to do is we have to remove these muscles. And then we'll get a window here where we can see muscles that are deep. So this is a complex muscle group. And the muscle group itself that we see spanning this whole area is called the erector spinae muscle. And they're a complex group of muscles. So there's two patterns that one has to understand to make sense of it. The first pattern is that starting at the scapular spines, excuse me, starting at the spinous processes of the vertebrae, then we have a muscle that sits next to the spinous processes that terminates here. So it's this muscle group from the pointer inward. We have another muscle group that starts here and terminates right here. And so it's called the longissimus group. 
And then we have this most lateral group that's called the iliocostalis. So kind of as a quick review, when we're looking at this spinal erector muscles, as we're going from medial to lateral, we have three muscles that form this group. Spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis. So the other pattern to this group is that the fi these fibers run from your skull all the way down to your sacrum. And so what we're going to do is we're going to separate muscles that cross the neck to the skull from muscles that go from upper ribs to the neck, and then eventually muscles that go from lower ribs to upper ribs. And they're erectors because they allow us to extend and laterally flex our vertebral column. So the muscles that would cross from upper, uh, from upper parts of the thoracic region uh, from either vertebrae and or ribs and attached to the skull are going to be capitis. So on your list, we'll have this most medial muscle that's going to be found crossing to the skull. So that'll be spinalis capitis. And then we'll see this medial group called longissimus that would be up here going from the upper ribs to the skull. So that's going to be called uh, longissimus capitis. Now as we move from muscles that go from ribs to transverse processes of uh, cervical vertebrae and they help us extend the neck, the capitis muscles extend the head, then we're going to see that same pattern. The most medial group setting next to the spines would be spinalis cervicus. The middle group setting more lateral would be longissimus cervicus going to the cervical vertebrae. And we have this outer group that didn't go clear to the skull that's called iliocostalis. And it would be found as the most lateral muscle group here going from ribs to the, the uh, vertebrae in the neck region, cervical vertebrae. And so it'd be called iliocostalis cervicus. Now the actual muscles that we're seeing here are muscles that actually go from lower ribs to higher ribs. They help us uh, extend and laterally flex our thorax and upper abdomen. They're called thoracic muscles. So the one that's most medial would be the spinalis thoracis. The one in the middle would be longissimus thoracis. And the one to the outside edge here would be iliocostalis thoracis. And the iliocostalis group is the one that goes the, the most inferior. And so part of the iliocostalis group actually comes off of the sacrum and the sacral spine and crosses the lumbar region to lower ribs. So this outer group is going to be called ilio because it's coming off the ilium. Costalis because it's attaching ribs. And then because the bottom part of it crosses the lumbar region, then we would call that lower portion of this muscle the iliocostalis lumborum. And we can't see that because we'd have to remove the latissimus dorsi and deeper muscles to see it. But uh, if you could visualize these muscles being cut away and this muscle having a big group going all the way down, then that would be the iliocostalis lumborum. So the muscles that uh, students also sometimes struggle with are the erector spinae group. If we just consider them the erector spinae, they're all involved in allowing you to stand erect, maintaining posture, extending and laterally flexing your vertebral column. And the muscles are a complex muscle group, and there's a pattern to them. So if we look at our, uh, our spinous processes of, of our vertebrae, these black dashes, then as we go from medial to lateral, we encounter three muscle groups, the spinalis, which are all the blue muscles, a longissimus, which are all of the red muscles, and an iliocostalis, which are all of the brown muscles we're seeing. So the first thing to recognize is medial to lateral, we have three muscle groups, 
and they're always in the same order, spinalis, longissimus, and iliac costalis. And then to be able to extend your head, extend your neck, extend your thorax, then the muscles have to be subdivided for leverage points uh, for those actions. So this represents the external occipital protuberance that you learn, and a line associated with that, which would be the superior neutral line. And then remember, inferior to that would be another line called the inferior neutral line. So any muscle that crosses the neck and attaches to the skull is going to be referred to as capitis. So what we can see is that the medial group, spinalis, does that. So what we do is we incorporate this name and this name into the name. So this one would be the spinalis capitis. And then the next group, which is the middle group, also crosses the neck to the skull. So it's the longissimus group. So if it's attaching to the skull, it's the longissimus capitis. We also have, for leverage on extending the neck and not just the head, we have muscles that come off of upper ribs and go to cervical vertebrae transverse processes. So the one next to the vertebral spines would be spinalis again. But since it's crossing the cervical region, then it's called spinalis cervicus because it's extending the cervical region of the body. We have a longissimus again, the middle group, longissimus cervicus. And now we have a new group whose name was Ilio, because it's on the ilium down here. Costalis, because it goes to ribs. And so we have this upper group that is the iliocostalis cervicus. We also have muscle fibers that cross from lower ribs to higher ribs, allow us to laterally flex our vertebral column and extend our vertebral column. And very important postural muscles that allow us to stand erect. So they're called thoracis because they're crossing the thoracic region. So the one next to the vertebral spines would be spinalis thoracis. The middle group would be longissimus thoracis. And then the outer group would be iliocostalis thoracis. And then the iliocostalis group is the only one that goes from lower ribs to the ilium. So therefore it crosses the lumbar region. And so the fibers that cross the lumbar region that are called iliocostalis lumbar. And so I think if you'll keep this in mind and you'll look at how we are segmented superior to inferior and medial to lateral, that the spinal erector muscles should make sense to you. We're going to complete our discussion of the axial skeletal muscles by looking at muscles that we find in the, in the pelvic floor. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a male pelvis and female pelvis. And what we'll see is there's considerable uh, similarity and then a couple subtle uh, differences. So if we remove the internal organs from both of these pelvises, then what we're going to see is that the floor of the pelvis is a very broad muscle. And that muscle actually attaches to the anus, which is this opening here. And what, when it contracts, it elevates the anus, uh, which is a process that you would use during the defecation. And so the muscle that's called, itself is called the levator ani. And so this really broad muscle we're seeing in the pelvic floor of the male here, and the broad muscle we're seeing in the pelvic floor of the female. Uh, is the levator A9 muscle. Now, if we focus on the tailbone, the coxial vertebrae that you learn, and we rotate the pelvis just a little bit, then what we'll see is that there's a muscle right here that's been separated from the levator A9 that we just talked about by this, this black line. So this muscle right here is a coccygeus muscle. And it gets its name because it's attaching to the coxial uh, vertebrae. And it's in the exact same place in a male, as demonstrated on this model, and then a female, as demonstrated by this model. So the other muscles that are in very, very similar locations are muscles that we use to actually close the anus. And so 
uh, when we look at muscles throughout the digestive system, we have smooth muscles that close openings, and so they're called internal sphincters. And then we have skeletal muscles that close openings, and they're called external sphincters. So the lighter muscle group we're seeing here to the inside is actually the internal anal sphincters. And they're not on your skeletal muscle list because they're actually smooth muscle. But those are involuntary. And so when babies are born, the internal anal sphincters are active and controllable. Are, are involuntary and the baby doesn't control them, excuse me, and they haven't learned to control their external anal sphincters, these darker band muscles that we see uh, more superficially to the internal ones. And these are actually skeletal muscles. And so until the brain muscle connections have maturated so that children can learn to control these external anal sphincters, then they have to be in diapers. So this is the external anal sphincter that we're seeing here on the male model. And then again on the female model, there would be the external anal sphincter that we're actually seeing. Now we have two muscles that are in the pelvic floor, but to see them we would have to look at the pelvis from this view. So I have a couple of different models that we can actually look at that actually show us the pelvic floor. So in this model of a female, then we're, we're looking at the labia majora here, the pubic symphysis would be here, and so the clitoris would be here. And so we have a muscle that actually goes around the urethral opening here and the vaginal opening here. That's the muscle that we're seeing lateral to both of those. And that muscle is called the bovospongiosis muscle. And it's a muscle that women would use to stop urine mid-flow, such as collect where the, you go to a doctor for a uh, urine catch and they tell you to start, stop, and then collect. So that would be the muscle that we would actually use. We also have muscles just lateral to that that actually come off the ischial tuberosities, which are these rounded structures that we're seeing toward the bottom of the model. And then the, model, the muscle runs at an angle and inserts on the inferior aspect of the uh, pubic symphysis here. So they're called ischiocavernosis muscles. So we see uh, one on this side, which would be the left one, and then one on this side, which would be the right one. And when you look at those, they create the top of a triangle. So those muscles define a clinical region that you would use, particularly in OBGYN uh, care, which is the perineal triangle. And these form the upper wall of the triangle. If we look at men in the same general location, then we could find the same muscles. So the muscles that would be identical would be the muscle we're seeing here or the muscle we're seeing here. Again, coming off the issue of tuberosities and going to uh, the pubic symphysis. And so those are ischial cavernosis muscles. Where women are not uh, fused midline, men are fused midline. And so where we were looking at the labia majora in women, we're looking at uh, what would be behind the scrotum, which are the tissue here, which would be the labia majora in men. And what we're seeing is a part of the penis called the bulb of the penis. And there's actually a muscle that wraps around the bulb of the penis that we're seeing here. And it compresses the urethra and stops urine flow. And so this is the bogospongiosis muscle in men. So that concludes uh, the muscles that you need to know for the axial skeleton. So we're going to start with this model, and we're going to look at the muscles associated with the shoulder. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the anterior aspect of the body, move around laterally and posteriorly as we do it. So this large muscle that we're seeing here is the pectoralis major. It gets its name because of the pectoral region, and it's the largest muscle in the group. So when you look closely at this muscle, it's got a really large head that we see here. It's got a, a little indent here that's separating it from a smaller head. And then it crosses the armpit into the arm. So the pectoralis major has two origins, a origin on the costal cartilage of the ribs and the sternum, this head, 
and a origin on the clavicle, on the medial third of the clavicle, which is this end, which is the clavicular end. So the origins are sternum, costal cartilage, clavicle. And then the muscle itself crosses the armpit and attaches to the lateral lip of the bicipital groove that we learned. Uh, and so if we cut this muscle away and reflect it, then we would have a smaller muscle that would underlay it, which is the pectoralis minor. So we're seeing the pectoralis major has been cut here. It is the pectoralis minor. And it originates on rib three, four, and five, the patterns we're seeing here. The pectoralis minor crosses from the ribs to the scapula, and underneath the deltoid here, it inserts on the coracoid process uh, of the scapula. Now, as we go more lateral, then a muscle that certainly overlies the pectoralis anterior and rotates around to the posterior aspect of the body is the deltoid. And the deltoid has three regions, this anterior deltoid that we're seeing here, a middle deltoid that we're seeing here, and a posterior deltoid that we're seeing here. And so they, the three heads have slightly different origins. So the anterior deltoid's origin is on the distal third of the clavicle and the acromion process. The middle deltoid is on the acromion process and part of the scapular spine. And then the posterior deltoid's origin is on the scapular spine. And so that allows this muscle to abduct, go out like this, and also come forward, flex with the anterior deltoid, and also go backwards, which would be extend with the posterior deltoid. So, so this one flexes and abducts. This one abducts, and this one extends and abducts. Now as we come on around, we have a muscle that is a very large muscle in the anterior aspect of the back. And again, it's gonna be a complex muscle like the deltoid that we just did that has three parts. So we have fibers here, we have fibers coming across here, and we have fibers coming up here. So what we typically do is we divide the trapezius into ante anterior, excuse me, superior tra trapezius, middle trapezius, and inferior trapezius. Or some people use upper trap, middle trap, and lower trap. So the upper trapezius uh, originates on the superior neutral line and the neutral ligament, which is this ligament we see associated with the cervical spines. The middle trap is coming off of upper thoracic spines, and the lower trap is coming off of lower thoracic spines. And the trapezius all inserts on the clavicle anteriorly, the distal third, the acromion process, and the scapular spine. And so again, depending on which muscle part you're using, it actually uh, elevates the scapula, retracts the scapula, and rotates the scapula based upon the direction of the fibers themselves. If we remove the trapezius, then we're gonna be able to see muscles whose origins are on the lower cervical, upper thoracic spines, and cross over to the vertebral border of the scapula. Notice that there's a division in the muscle right here. So we have a larger part of the muscle here, smaller part of the muscle here. So the lower part of the muscle is the rhomboides major, and the smaller part of the muscle here is the rhomboides minor and they retract the scapula, pulling it toward the midline, and rotate the scapula, depending on which component of the rhomboids is actually contracting. And then if we look superior to where the rhomboids are inserting on the scapular spine, we actually have a muscle that inserts on the superior angle of the scapula, 
uh, and superior vertebral board of the scapula. This muscle originates on the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae, and so when the muscle contracts, it elevates the scapula as in shrugging the shoulder, so it, that's where the muscle gets its name, which is the levator scapula. As we continue further down on the back, we have a very large muscle that we can see right here that is actually originating under the lower trap and then originating on fascia associated with the lumbar vertebrae and the iliac crest. So it's a really broad muscle in the back. So the first part of the muscle's name, latissimus, tells us that it's a very wide muscle. And then the last part of the name tells us where it's wide, latissimus dorsi. So the latissimus dorsi is actually going to cross the armpit and attach to the humerus. And so where it's going to insert on the humerus is the medial lip of the bicipital groove. Now continuing to look at muscles associated with the shoulder and the scapula, On this side where we've actually removed the, the trap, we can see a muscle here. We can see this smaller muscle superior to it, this larger muscle, and then on the other side of the scapular spine, we see a muscle that's associated with the scapular spine up here. So these muscles are all originating on the scapula and they're all going to insert uh, around the head of the humerus. So the upper three muscles, supraspinatus, given an, a name given because it's superior to the scapular spine, infraspinatus, because it originates in the infraspinous fossa, and then teres minor, which is this smaller muscle right here, all uh, have tendons that go around the head of the uh, humerus and keep it in place. So they're all called rotator cuff muscles. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor are three of the four rotator cuff muscles. The last muscle that we can see posterior, which is this muscle, is the teres major. And it actually originates on the inferior angle axillary border of the scapula and crosses the, the armpit and goes lower on the humerus. So it is not a rotator cuff muscle because it's not involved in helping keep the head of the humerus in the glenoid fossa. So as we come around to the lateral component of the thorax, then we have a very large muscle that is under pectoralis major when pectoralis major is in place and interacts with the external oblique at the ribs right here. And so its origin is on the first eight ribs, which is what we're seeing here. And this muscle is actually going to, the fibers are going to flow posterior, they're going to go beneath the scapula and the muscle itself is going to insert on the anterior aspect of the vertebral border of the scapula. So its name, serratus, is because of this sawtoothed edge that we see associated with the ribs, and then serratus anterior because that's where it's serrated. Now, there's another muscle that actually crosses off the scapula that we can see right here that's actually going to go to the arm. So if we remove the deltoid uh, right here, we can see a muscle that's originating on the coracoid process of the scapula and going to the upper arm or the humerus. So its name uh, is a origin insertion name. So coraco because it's on the coracoid process and brachium because it's associated with the upper arm. So coracobrachialis uh, is a weak flexor of the arm that we can see in there location. 
So as we continue on the arm out to Anvik Bhav, if we look at the anterior compartment of the arm, then the largest muscle we're seeing here is the biceps brachii. It gets its name biceps because it has two heads. So it has a long head and a short head. What we're seeing right here is the short head of the biceps, and it's going to the coracoid process that we've been talking about. The long head of the biceps is actually going to have a tendon that crosses over the head of the humerus following the bicipital groove and attaching to the upper lip of the glenoid fossa of the scapula. So this would be biceps brachii, two origins for the name biceps. And then its insertion is going to be on the other side of the elbow uh, on the radial tuberosity. So since it crosses the radial tuberosity, crosses the elbow, then it is a forearm flexor, which brings the forearm upward as in the position that Big Bob is in right here. So if we look at several of these muscles that we've been talking about on a different model, then what we can see is we've removed the scapula, so a lot of the superficial muscles we were seeing are no longer in place, but we do see the deltoid here. So this muscle would be the infraspinatus that we have already discussed. And then this muscle would be the uh, teres minor that we've already discussed. And then the teres major that we've discussed. So now if we rotate it, what we have is, is we've removed the serratus anterior so that now we see a muscle that sits in the subscapular fossa of the scapula. So it gets its name from that origin. So it's called the subscapularis. It is the fourth of our rotator cuff muscles. So subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor make up our rotator cuff muscles. Now the muscle we just did was this muscle right here which is coracobrachialis, coming off the coracoid process and going to the brachium. And then this muscle is uh, biceps brachii. So coming off the coracoid process with its short head, and then its long head going to the glenoid cavity, and then insertion on the radial tuberosity. Deep to biceps brachii is a muscle that uh, originates on the distal third of the humerus, crosses the elbow to uh, the ulna, and the ulnar tuberosity is the brachialis muscle. And it's the strongest of our forearm flexors, as it, and it works along with biceps brachii and coracobrachialis. What we're going to do is we're going to finish up muscles associated with the, the shoulder joint. And so one of the muscles that we're going to talk about is this little muscle here. And it gets its name because it sits underneath the clavicle, so it's the subclavius. Its origin is on the first rib. Its insertion is on the inferior portion of the clavicle, and it depresses and protracts the, the clavicle. So from here, what we're going to do is we're going to move down to the muscles that exist in the brachium, and then eventually muscles that exist in the forearm. That one? As soon as it goes again. So when we look at the muscles that are involved in movement of the brachium, the large anterior muscle is the biceps brachii. It gets its name biceps because it has two origins and then a single insertion. So what we do with origins is we call them heads and then we divide it into uh, descriptive parts. So with the biceps, we have a short head. So we see the short head of the biceps right here 
going to the coracoid process of the scapula. And then the long head is this portion of the biceps. If we remove the deltoid, then we can see the tendon of the long head of the biceps sitting in the bicipital groove or intertubecular groove or sulcus passing over the head of the humerus where it reflects back to the superior lip of the glenoid cavity on the, on the scapula it's called the superior glenoid tubercle. The biceps insertion is the radial tuberosity. So the biceps uh, crosses the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So when we look at the actions of the biceps, it flexes the, the uh, arm at the elbow and then does some supination of the arm as well. And that's because the radial tuberosity is on the radius, which is the muscle that rotates. Uh, deep to the biceps is the stronger of the forearm flexors, and that's brachialis that we're seeing here. And brachialis originates on the anterior portion of the humerus, about a third of the way uh, down from the shoulder, and then inserts on the ulna and on the ulnar tuberosity. So it inserts on, a, on an arm bone that doesn't rotate. So the brachialis is a forearm flexor, but not a supinator. So as we move into the forearm, we have muscles that are uh, coming across from the shoulder joint to the forearm. So what we're going to do is we're going to start on the thumb side and look at uh, the muscles that are on the thumb side and then we're going to come back and look at muscles on the ulnar side of the forearm. So the largest muscle here on our thumb side is brachioradialis and brachioradialis originates on the distal part of the humerus and the lateral epicondyle and then crosses the forearm joint and continues down the arm as we see the tendon here to uh, an insertion point near the styloid process of the radius. And so its name, brachio, is the fact that its origin is on the humerus and then radialis because its insertion is on the radius near the styloid process. And it is a forearm flexor at the elbow as well. So as we look at the posterior component of the arm then, uh, we have the triceps brachii. So again, the triceps brachii gets its name from the fact that it has three origins. And so as we can see here, we have an origin that is on the scapula. So uh, it originates on the scapula and that's called the long head of the triceps. We have uh, part of the muscle with its origin here, uh, which is on the humerus, uh, and so that is the lateral head of the, bi of the triceps. And then as we look at the uh, triceps right here, there's a small portion of the triceps whose origin is on the humerus as well, but more distal, and that is the medial head of the triceps. The triceps comes together to form this tendon right here that attaches to the electron process of the ulna. So all three heads of the triceps are involved in extension of the forearm. So we need to finish one more muscle that is in the upper arm. And so the muscle just medial to the biceps brachii that we would see in the axilla or armpit region is the coracobrachialis. So it gets its name because of its origin on the coracoid process and the fact that it is going to terminate on the medial aspect of the humerus. So it's its name, coracobrachialis, and it's a weak flexor of the forearm, uh, of the arm, excuse me. And so as we move into the elbow region, we've already done brachioradialis that we can 
can see here. And so the muscles that we see on the anterior aspect of the forearm are typically going to be flexors. And they get their name because they are going to either flex the wrist or flex the hands. So the muscle that we're seeing right here uh, is flexor carpi radialis. So it's on the thumb side, which makes it radialis. It's going to actually flex the wrist, so hence the name carpi. So flexor carpi radialis. As we find flexor carpi radialis, uh, we're going to have a muscle whose origin is on the medial epicondyle, and it's going to continue over to the uh, anterior surface of the radius. And so it is going to pronate the forearm, so it gets its name pronator teres. As we go uh, to the middle of muscle within the forearm complex, we have a muscle whose tendon uh, inserts on this connective tissue in the palm of your hand. So it's, this is called the flexor retinaculum. And so since its tendon uh, inserts on the flexor retinaculum, then it's called the palmaris because of this insertion in the palm of the hand, and palmaris longus because it has this really long tendon. Palmaris longus is a muscle that uh, some people lack, and there's a regional uh, geographical pattern to that within the world. So if you actually make a fist like this, and you don't have this center tendon that stands out, then there's a good chance that you lack palm, palmaris longus. Now as we go more lateral from palmaris longus, then we have a muscle that is originating on the medial epicondyle of the humerus and then inserting down here near the pisiform. And so this muscle is going to be the flexor carpi ulnaris because of its uh, position on the little finger side of the arm. Now, before we move to the posterior component of the, of the forearm, what I would like to do is I'd like to remove brachioradialis. So with brachioradialis out of the way, we see a deep muscle, which is the supinator muscle. So the super, supinator muscle is going to have its origin on uh, the humerus and then its insertion on the radius, and then it's going to roll the radius around in the process of supinating the hand. And the tendons we see up here are all going to connect to the wrist and the fingers, and they're going to straighten the wrist, straighten the fingers, and a process we call extension. So the muscles back here are extenders. So if we continue with flexor carpi radialis that we did a couple of minutes ago, then as we come to the next muscle uh, toward the posterior aspect of the arm, then we're going to run into extensor carpi radialis. Notice that this one's tendon is coming to the anterior aspect of the, of the, of the wrist, and this one is coming, coming to the posterior aspect of the wrist. So from flexor carpi, ray, uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, we can rotate the arm, and we can find brachioradialis that we did earlier. And we're going to have two muscles sitting next to uh, brachioradialis. And they're the extensor carpi radialis muscles. And if you look closely, you're going to have one that has got a longer belly and tendon. And then sitting next to it is one that's got a shorter belly and tendon. So the two muscles themselves are separated into flexor carpi radialis longus, flexor carpi radialis brevis. And they, excuse me, extensor carpi, let's do that over. Can you no, just, just pretend it didn't happen and do it and I go back in. And so the two muscles are called the extensor carpi uh, radi radialis muscles because they're going to the thumb side. One has a long tendon and belly, one has a shorter tendon and belly. So what we do is we separate them into uh, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis. 
and both of those are involved in wrist extension. So that concludes the muscles of the upper extremity, uh, including the forearm and uh, the shoulder. So what we're going to do now is look at the muscles of the lower extremity, including the muscles associated with movement of the femur at the hip, and then move down the leg as we go. So posteriorly, the largest muscle associated with our pelvic girdle is this muscle, which is the gluteus maximus. If you notice, it'll actually come off of the, the iliac crest, the anterior superior iliac, anterior posterior iliac spine, and the sacrum itself. And then the fibers cross the gluteal region, and it inserts on uh, a fossa, fascia here associated with the iliotibial tract, which is the connective tissue we're seeing right here. And there are actually three muscles in this group, the gluteus maximus, and notice that its fibers continue lower on the uh, femur, uh, and so it's going to have a slightly different action than the other two. So it's going to be a extensor of the uh, hip as well as a adductor, abductor of the hip, as well as an abductor of the hip. Now if we move more toward the lateral line, we can see that there's a relief here. And we're seeing a little piece of a muscle running off the, the iliac crest and going down toward the greater trochanter right here. So this muscle is one of the assisters of this and belongs to the group, uh, the gluteal group of muscles. So this is the gluteus uh, medius. Now what I want to do is I want to transfer uh, from this model to a model where we have pulled the gluteus maximus away so we can, ins we can see this muscle. And then we're going to have this muscle cut where we can see a deeper muscle. So as you look at this model, then what we've done is we've cut the gluteus maximus here so that you can see that it's been cut. And then the muscle we were just looking at, the gluteus medius, has been cut here and here. So that the muscle we're looking at uh, underneath this is the gluteus minimus. And it comes off the ilium and goes to the greater trochanter as well. So since these two muscles are coming off the upper part of the ilium and going to the greater trochanter, then they lack the ability to extend the leg, but only do abduction of the hip, uh, joining gluteus maximus in that action as well. So as we move from gluteus minimus, we'll have a muscle right here, which is called piriformes. And then piriformes uh, is a abductor of the hip as well. But piriformes is kind of unique in that one of its landmarks is this big nerve that usually arises just under it, which is the sciatic nerve. So if you find the sciatic nerve, the muscle just superior to it is going to be uh, piriformes. And then the muscle superior and lateral to that is going to be the gluteus minimus. So that gives you a nice way to locate these muscles. And oftentimes when people have been doing something that requires a lot of hip abduction, then the glute, this piriformes gets tight it will impinge on the sciatic nerve and create sciatic pain. As we move toward the lateral component of the muscles associated with the iliac crest, we have this muscle right here coming off of the iliac crest near the anterior superior iliac spine. And it continues down and inserts on the iliotibial tract, or what com people commonly refer to as the IT band. And so this muscle gets its name because it creates a lot of tension on the lateral aspect of the thigh and it contains a lot of connective tissue. So the muscle is called the tensor for creating that tension and then fascia lata for 
the extensive amount of connective tissue in the IT band associated with that. But what we had just finished looking at was this muscle, which is the tensor fasciolata on this leg model, and how it comes into the IT band as its insertion. So what we're going to do is we're going to go across the leg, uh, starting with the anterior superior iliac spine. We're going to look at muscles that we'll see in the groin area. Uh, and so just medial to tensor fasciolata is this muscle, which is one of the longest muscles in your body, which crosses clear over to from the lateral aspect of the leg to the medial, medial aspect of the leg. So origin is the anterior superior iliac spine. And then its insertion is going to be on the uh, upper portion of the tibia. And so this is sartorius. And sartorius is going to be a hip extender and a uh, abductor. So as we move from sartorius and we find the window through which the femoral arteries and veins are exiting the abdominal cavity up here, then there's a muscle that sits right next to that. So one of the ways you can usually locate it is the fact that the femoral artery and vein override it. And so this is pectineus. Uh, and so pectineus comes off of the superior pubic ramus and then runs to the, the femur. Next to pectineus is our two muscles. And so one of the muscles is going to be deep, and then the other muscle is going to be, or is going to be superficial. So in this little triangular window that we can see here, they're trying to give you a relief that it's a muscle deep to the pectineus, and it's a muscle that's deep to this muscle, which is the adductor longus. So the little muscle we're seeing in the window is the adductor brevis. Its origin is on the inferior pubic ramus, and again, it crosses the femur to the linea aspera, where it's going to abduct, abduct excuse me, adduct and flex the leg. The muscle that overrides that is actually the adductor longus, and the adductor longus is actually coming off the pubic crest here as its origin, and then passing to the linea aspera and it is a adductor of the leg as well. So there's a muscle that's really deep that belongs to this muscle group that adductor brevis and adductor longus belong to. And it is a muscle that we're seeing here uh, between the legs. It's also a muscle we're seeing here in this triangular window where sartorius is running right here. And that's the adductor magnus. And the adductor magnus originates on the uh, ischial tuberosity and the inferior uh, pubic ramus. And then again, crosses to the femur to the linea spera. And it is by far the strongest of all the adductors of the hip. A muscle that's associated with those muscles, but hasn't retained the adductor uh, in part of its name, is this thin muscle that we're seeing on the innermost part of the thigh. It's actually a muscle that gets its name gracilis from the fact that it's thin, but it's actually a, another adductor of the thigh. Uh, and so its origin is going to be up here on the pubic bone. And then its insertion then is going to be uh, down here in the distal end of the femur and the uh, upper portion of the tibia itself, so gracilis. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the muscles that are involved in the anterior compartment of the thigh. And uh, they are actually going to uh, cross the knee and they're going to result in knee extension as a group. So the most anterior of the muscles, which also has the, the highest origin, is this muscle, which is rectus femoris. It actually originates on the anterior inferior iliac spine. 
and then its tendon uh, of insertion inserts on the patella uh, in a tendon called the tendon of quadriceps femoris. And so its major action is, is involved in knee extension. But because it also crosses the hip joint, it does some hip flexion. The muscles that are associated with it in a large muscle group that we call the quadriceps, the vastus medialis, excuse me, the, the muscle that is muscles associated with it that form a group we call the quadriceps is the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis. And if we take rectus femoris off, vastus intermedius. Now the vastus muscles arise on the femur, the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis arising on the back of the femur uh, on the linea aspera, and then the vastus intermedius arising or originating on the anterior aspect of the femur. Their tendons all come together to help form the tendon of quadriceps here. Uh, and so they're all lower leg extenders as well. So what actually happens is this tendon of all these large muscles attaches to the top of the patella. We have a patellar ligament that attaches the patella to the tibial tuberosity. So in net effect, the force of the muscles is converted through, conveyed through the patella to the tibial tuberosity, which is how the muscles are involved in lower leg extension. So the muscles that would have an antagonistic action on those muscles are actually muscles that we can see in the posterior compartment of the leg. And so this muscle group is collectively called the hamstrings. They all originate on the uh, radial, on the, excuse me, they all originate on the ischial tuberosity and laterally, we have a muscle that has two heads, a long head that originates on the ischial tuberosity, and then a short head that we see under here that originates on the uh, femur itself. And so this is called the biceps femoris. On the medial aspect of the leg, we have muscles that originate on the ischial tuberosity, and we have a superficial muscle with a long tendon, then we have a deeper muscle that has a longer belly and a short tendon. So the muscles get their name, semitendinosus, because of this long tendon coming down to the medial aspect of the tibia. And then this muscle with the really long fleshy belly that comes down to the medial aspect of the tibia as well. So this is called the semimembranosus. So these two muscles are commonly found uh, together uh, in this medial compartment of, of the back of the thigh. And all three of these muscles are knee flexors. So they pull the knee backwards as an inflex of the knee. So before we move on to the lower leg, what we want to do is cover one more muscle that's involved in hip flexion. Uh, and so we have a muscle that comes through the, the obturator foramen and then extends up and attaches to lumbar vertebrae. So it's called the psoas muscle. And then the muscle that's associated with it sets in the iliac fossa, and it's referred to as the iliacus. In recent years, the iliacus and the psoas muscles have been put together into one muscle group called the iliopsoas muscle. And then the origin is on the iliac fossa and lumbar vertebrae. Insertion is on the femur and therefore it pulls the femur forward as in flex, flexing the hip. So that concludes the upper part of the leg. So what we're going to do look next is look at the lower leg muscles and we're going to start with the posterior compartment. So the, the most definitive muscles that you can see in someone's posterior leg as they're walking are the gastrocnemius here. The gastrocs actually have two heads, a medial head and a lateral head. 
and come off the medial uh, epicondyle, lateral epicondyle of the femur, uh, respectively. And then their insertion is a broad tendon that tapers to a tendon down here that attaches to the calcaneus. So we refer, refer to this as the Achilles tendon. So the gastrocs actually cross two joints. They cross the knee joint and then they cross the ankle joint. So they're going to have different actions. So the gastroc, because it crosses the ankle joint, is a plantar flexor. So it actually is the muscle you use to stand on your tiptoes. Because the muscle also crosses the knee joint, then it becomes a knee flexor as well. So a muscle deep to this muscle group that we can see here on the lateral aspect on each side is soleus. And in soleus, because it doesn't cross two joints and its origin is on the posterior aspect of the tibia here, then it, it comes into the calcaneus as well. And then so soleus is uh, typically only a plantar flexor of the lower leg so, and the ankle. So if we were to remove these muscles, then if we remove the gastrocnemius and the soleus, then one of the deepest muscles that we can find sitting on the posterior aspect of the tibia is tibialis posterior. And so that's the muscle we're actually seeing right here. And it is also a plantar flexor of the ankle itself. So when we look at the anterior compartment of the lower leg, uh, one of our landmarks is the tibial crest. So you'll notice that medially we have no muscle at all, but the bone is just under the skin. So as we go lateral from the tibial crest, there is a muscle called the tib tibialis anterior. So its origin is going to be on the lateral epicondyle of the tibia. And then its insertion is going to be this tendon that comes across the foot. And it's going to insert on the first metatarsal and cuneiform of the foot right here. So it's going to pull the foot upward. So it's a dorsiflexor of the foot. Because it's crossing from lateral to medial, it's also going to rotate the sole of the foot inward so it will invert the foot. So that is the muscle we're seeing right here next to the tibial crest, tibialis anterior.